Well, good morning, everybody. We continue our series on the book of Esther, uh, one of the two books of the 66 books of the Bible named after a woman. Ten chapters, takes about 28 minutes to read. It's the only book of the entire Bible that the name of God is never even mentioned. And we're in part six, and so if you're just now joining us, that's okay. I uh, wanna set the foundation for you today by giving you a little recap, but we're gonna uh, jump in. I can't give you all the details of the last five weeks. What I'd encourage you to do is check it out online at our website or a podcast, and you can uh, catch up as we put a bookend on the series next Sunday with the finale of this story of a queen. Uh, I wanna start by saying, if you're taking notes on the back of the worship guide, I invite you to just jump right in, and I wanna tell you that this is not hype today, what I'm about to say to you. What I'm about to say to you is truth, and here it is. This message could save the rest of your life. I'm serious. This message, not because how good it's gonna be. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's good. No, 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 no. This message, because in fact, you may want to just scratch out your and really put, this message could save the rest of my life because if you don't personalize it, it's really gonna be hard for you to receive everything that God has for you today. So to set the tone for the rest of the message, let's recap. The largest kingdom on the planet is Persia. The most powerful man on the planet is the king of this nation, Xerxes. He has banished his own queen because she disobeyed an order. He has called a mass beauty pageant to take place across the 127 provinces of his nation. And for over an, a year, thousands of women prepare to walk the stage and earn the twinkle of the eye of the king and there is a woman who is a Jew. Her name is Esther. She keeps her nationality and her faith a secret. She goes through all of the pagan rituals. She goes through all of the pagan diets. She goes through all the process to finally stand before the king. And the king is immediately attracted to Esther. He chooses Esther as his queen. And she is now gone from absolute obscurity to opulence. She has now gone from someone that nobody knew to someone who everybody bows to whenever her carriage passes through the city gates. She was given the instruction to keep her nationality and faith a secret by her cousin who raised her. She was orphaned as a young child and Mordecai, who we've called the bishop in this whole game of chess, who moves diagonally through the story, we see that Mordecai, although that he has been raising her and preparing her for this time, he also is inside the palace gates and he in one day is overhearing two guards talk about how they're gonna assassinate Xerxes. And so he goes to Queen Esther and tells the, uh, Queen Esther about the situation. She tells an authority. They go and investigate it. And sure enough, they find it to be true. They kill the two guards that were, for, that were getting this a plan of attack. And the truth is this whole story of Mordecai like telling on these two guards, it was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes. That is the end of one chapter. The next chapter begins that after these events, King Xerxes honored, you would think Mordecai because of what he had just done, but Mordecai somehow gets forgotten. Have you ever been forgotten? Have you ever gotten overlooked? Has someone received the promotion you didn't receive? Did someone get the invite to Hoko and you didn't get the invite? That's homecoming for some of you older ones. Sure enough, Haman, that we call the knight because the knight is, is this only player on the entire chessboard that can actually jump over different people. He's gonna jump over and receive the place of honor and accolade instead of Mordecai. He's placed in a prominent position and uh, Mordecai, uh, Haman is going to be uh, put as prime minister over Persia. And as he is going through the city streets, the king has commanded that everybody that sees Haman has to bow because Haman basically represents the king. And here's where the plot thickens because as Haman would be passing by Mordecai, Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Because of that, Haman was enraged. Everybody say enraged. He just ticked off. He's mad, he's angry, he's good and angry. 
This is going to be like a telltale of the rest of Haman's life. And so he is enraged. Uh, he, he doesn't know what to do. Yet having learned that Mordecai's people were, uh, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai and what he wants to do. Instead, Haman looks for a way to destroy all the Jews. He didn't just say, hey, you're gonna bow. I'm gonna force you to bow. Or I'm gonna cut your ACLs. Or he, he just plots not just to kill Mordecai, but he's gonna destroy all the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. And so he goes to the king, he says, there's this group of people, they don't care about you, they do their own thing, I wanna wipe them out, I'll pay you to wipe them out. And this king, who's supposed to be loving and benevolent, says, go for it, Haman, I don't wanna deal with it. And sure enough, dispatches were sent by couriers all to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all of the Jews. Now, Esther, the promoted pawn, is where she is. She has now become Queen Esther, and she is in the palace when Mordecai hears that this edict has been done, the, the, the edict has been, has been put out. Uh, Mordecai goes to Queen Esther, and he says, look, you're in here for a reason. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews are gonna arise from another place. Like, like uh, we're still gonna be okay as the Jewish people, but you and your father's family are gonna perish. Like, we're gonna die if you don't do something. And goes on to say, now who knows that you've come to your royal position for such a time as this, this quote for such a time as this has been quoted by Queen Elizabeth, Martin Luther King Jr., Abraham Lincoln, Nelson Mandela, and this is the queen's gambit. The gambit is a strategic risk that you have to take in order to uh, get an advantageous position in chess, and this has become her risk. Because if she goes and she tells the king what's going on and she's not been invited because she hasn't been invited into his house, into his uh, presence for 30 days. He's got a harem full of a thousand plus women. He is not lonely. He's got anybody, any time to take care of any need he might have. And it's been 30 days since he even called on Esther. She says to, to Mordecai, I, I don't even know, like, if, if I go into this presence, he could have me killed. That was the law. But this is her risk. She says, you guys fast for three days, and we, um, me and my attendants, are gonna fast for three days just like you do. And when this is done, I'll risk it. I'll have the courage. I'll go to the king, even though it's against the law. Even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And there's gonna be a time where that's just not a pithy statement anymore. There is gonna be opportunity for you to be challenged, for you to be ridiculed, for you to be criticized by having biblical moral foundation for your life. That's antiquated, that's old school, that's bigoted, that's prejudice. You, you, you're gonna have a, you're gonna, you're gonna rely on the word of God as your foundation to define what, 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 what really needs to happen? Come on, get with the program. But Esther says, no matter what they throw at me, if I perish, I perish. Sure enough, three days later, the fast is over and she is going to have the doors of the kingdom of the royal throne opened and she's gonna walk in and if the king doesn't look at her immediately, her throat's gonna be slit. But the moment she, she walks into the throne room, the king catches her eye and, and, and he catches hers and, and he says, uh, what you doing? Where are you at? You got plans? Don't say that. <laughs> he says, east, uh, you know, east wing, west wing, this mansion, what's happening? Like, that's going to leave the door open. Anyway, he stretches out the royal scepter and says, come on. She comes to him and he goes, what, what's up, girl? And she goes, if I found favor in you, can we have a party together tonight, you and, and bring your, your second in charge, Haman? And he says, sure enough. So they show up that night, Haman's pumped, like what, you and the queen? Don't mind if I do. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine, the king asked Esther, now what is it, your petition, like it'll be given, what's your request, even up to half the kingdom? Like, I wanna be generous to you, you my girl, okay? House clean, pool warm, all right? 
Esther replies, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and to fulfill my request, here's what I'm asking. Will you let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet and I'll prepare for them? Girl, why are you teasing me? Wait till tomorrow, I wanna to tell you more. And what he, she's doing is his own strategy. If you remember at the very beginning of the book, six months of one party and then the next seven days, a whole nother party. She is using the same strategy of, of basically taking time to connect with the king she hasn't seen for 30 days. Now, as they closed down this wine-filled party, Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. I get to hang out with the most beautiful girl in the palace, in the world, really, and I get to hang out with the king, and I'm the only one that gets invited, little does he know, and we'll see this next week as we close this series, that this is going to be an invitation to the rest of his life. And the rest of his life is gonna be very short. Careful what you're excited about. He was in high spirits because he was getting the, the accolades he wanted. He was getting the, 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 the um, prominence he felt he deserved. She wasn't bowing, but, she, but he was getting invited to the place that nobody else was getting invited. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate as he was going back home and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear again in his presence, he was yet again filled with rage against Mordecai. Filled with rage against Mordecai. So the question is this. <clears throat> what happens when you let pride rage unchecked? This rage that welled up in Haman every time something didn't happen the way he expected it or the way he deserved, he felt. Pride would rage unchecked in his life. And it produced an edict that is gonna annihilate an entire group of people in this kingdom because of his pride and his ego. Haman, all throughout history of the Bible, is one of the greatest examples, the seminal source of pride, what it does to your life when it goes unchecked. You said this was gonna possibly save my life and we're talking about pride? I know, I know. Hang with me. To kind of situate the rest of this sermon, let's talk about pride. You can write down the working definition for today. Pride is this. Pride is a ruthless, sleepless concentration on self. It doesn't sleep, it doesn't, it's so focused. And many times it happens without you even knowing it. It's it's like leaving the iron on and it never shutting off. It's like you, you just leave it on green, pride. And it is this never anything. This is why God says, love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself is the greatest commandment. Because we, even as kids, like we are driven to just love self, be about self, focus on self. And that, that relentless, sleepless focus on self it will kill you and you won't even know it. Now, if we were to flip the coin and we were laying on heads or tails, the truth is pride has two sides. Heads, you win with pride. Tails, you lose with pride. Two sides of pride. You can write them down. There's the one side that's a very much, uh, very common that you and when you're thinking right now about pride, you're probably thinking this side of the coin of pride, and that is superior pride. Guys, catch up on the on the on the slide if you can, please. The superior side of pride. Now, here's what the superior side uh, sounds like. We've got superior side that <laughs> I deserve accolades, right? And then you have the other one that's a little less common and many of us deal with it as well. Maybe we deal with both. It's the inferior side of pride. So the superior side, let me show it to you this way. It's all about arrogance. Anybody know anybody arrogant, right? Somebody nudged their spouse just a second ago. <laughs> you know, mm, I am so glad you are here to hear this. <laughs> 
there's an arrogance that says, I know what I need to know. Don't, you, don't, don't even try to tell me anything, okay? I've, I've, I've walked a mile, seen a mile, okay? Until you walk in my shoes, you really don't know what all this is about. There's a superior pride that's an arrogance, that's a confidence that can actually be a control. No, 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 don't tell me what to do. I already know the way things need to go. All right, let me say it again. I already know the way things need to go, so don't tell me what to do. It's my way. That's a superior side of pride. The inferior side of pride, though, sounds a whole lot different. As a matter of fact, we live with this side a whole lot more commonly because the inferior side is worry. Worry? How is that even pride? Because look, the arrogant person says, I already know the way things need to go. And you look at them and say, how arrogant. But the person who worries about everything, guess what they're saying? I know the way things need to go. And they're not going the way things need to go because I know, and they're going another way. And if it goes this way, it's gonna be terrible. And so fear and worry are actually pride incognito. It's just an inferior side. It's the flip of the coin where you're like, you don't understand my situation. You don't know. And oh, it's gotta be. That's actually pride because it's a relentless, sleepless concentration on your way. Pride has some characteristics way beyond a square jaw or a haughtiness. It can actually have lots of different forms. There's some characteristics. Write these down. Pride makes some common proclamations. And you don't have to search far to see these proclamations. It may be across the dinner table. More than likely, it's coming up on your newsfeed on social media. And we see the superior and the inferior form of pride all across social media these days. Don't we? Don't we? Okay, careful, because you probably have done it too and you don't even realize it. Because statements like, I deserve better than this. I deserve better than this. Who do they think they are? Hey, to the person that cut the person that cut me off in traffic, I hope you know. That's not just a criticism, that's pride. Right? If you want another lesson on this, go to what's happened in Nacogdoches, what's happened in Angelina County, and you'll get 17 <laughs> lessons a minute. At least I'm not like them. Who do they think they are? There's no way I would ever do that. There's no way I would ever say that, think that, do that. There's no way. That, what kind of mom is that that lets that happen, that says that, that does that with their kids or doesn't do that with their kids? How could they even think that? Oh man, we've heard that like on, the, on repeat. Republicans, Democrats, Fox, FOX, CNN, MSNBC, OMG, like it's all over, you know it. Oh, here's one. Oh, I love this one. Be better, do better. Be better, do better. And yet, that is such arrogance. It's such pride. Be better, do better, because you are obviously not to my standard. I am so much better than you. The inferior pride, everybody okay? You still with me? <laughs> Some of you are like, holy crap, I gotta delete all this stuff from Facebook. Has he been looking at my stuff? <laughs> I would never say that from the platform. I know, you're right. That's what my mom just said as she's watching. <laughs> no one ever appreciates what I do. It'd be nice to get a little appreciation around here. No one appreciates all that I do for them. That's actually inferior pride because it's all folks about self. It's like I can't do anything right. And we put that out there and really what we're hoping for is we're hoping that that's a, fix, a fishing expedition that hooks the bait that someone will come back and say, you do so many things right. Why do you need that? 
because it's a focus on self. And if I don't get the recognition or the admiration from someone else, I won't get my tank filled up. And so I'm focusing and it's an actual pride that will kill me from the inside out. Hey, I'm the odd one out in every group or I'm sorry for being such a burden. I'm sorry for being such a burden. There's two things. Number one, like, no, you're not a burden. When then they go into the other room and say, they are such a burden, (laughs) right? It happens. Pride has some common proclamations. So are we doing a little self inventory today? Here's another one. Pride makes you a fool. You know why? Because you can't teach a fool anything. Here's what's even scarier. The Bible says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Why is that? Because children like to talk about you, 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 you usually, but but occasionally they wanna talk about me, myself, and I, and it's mine, and it's mine, and it's mine, and me, and I want my way. And you wanna teach your kids to, look, consider others above yourself. What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then what happens, though, is that pride, if, if foolishness is not unbound in the child, guess what that child becomes? A bound-up, foolish adult. Here's how it looks. Superior pride, the pride that makes you a fool that won't learn anything, a superior pride looks like this. I'm the smartest person here. And the person who says they're the smartest person here is very quickly not the smartest person there. But that's a superior pride. But the inferior pride is also dangerous because I don't have anything to contribute here. So the person who's the smartest person in the room, they always feel like they have to talk first. Anybody ever known anybody like that? They're the first to speak up. Or the person that doesn't have anything to contribute, they don't ever raise their voice. So if they don't ever raise their voice, they don't learn. And if this guy won't ever shut up, they don't learn. So what happens is you are dismissive of criticism when you have a superior pride. What do you know? I've been doing this a little bit longer than you've been doing this, buddy, right? But the person who's inferior in their pride, you are devastated by criticism. So the prideful person dismisses criticism. The prideful person is devastated by criticism and you'll never grow because pride will keep you a fool. Are you following me so far? Here's what else. Now this sounds a little intense, but it's true. Pride makes you evil. Pride was is like, pride is like the Petri dish that all other sin grows in. It's why the very first commandment of the 10 commandments, thou shall have no other gods. It's not that you're struggling with a God that has goat hair and a totem pole. It's that Your God is usually, or my God is five foot seven and not goat hair, but like losing hair. I am the God that stands before God because I have a relentless, sleepless concentration on self that I have to battle against all the time. But it's that Petri dish, so guess what happens? The Bible says don't get angry in your sin. How many of you ever gotten angry? In your, in your anger, do not sin. So you can be angry and not sin, but when you stay angry, it makes you evil. You know why? Because what happens is you can't stay angry at that person unless you feel superior to that person. So if I stay holding a grudge, if I stay angry, if I stay bitter, if I stay, oh, I'm just, you wait till what's coming, you don't even realize it. But you're not hurting them, you're hurting you. Because it's pride. And pride, the Bible says, not only does it come before destruction, you know how your sin will slow you down and put you in quicksand? and keep you from all God has for you? The Bible says God opposes the proud. So it's one thing to be stuck in the mire and the quicksand of sin, but when you add to it that God opposes you, stiff arms you, 
When you're proud, can I take it one step further? In the book of Proverbs, it gives us six things that God hates. And you know what one of them is? Haughty eyes, prideful eyes. When you see other people and you don't have what, you have what they don't have and you're proud, you don't have what they have and you deserve it and you're proud, pride comes before destruction. But here's the other side. If you, you can't stay angry at yourself unless you feel inferior to them. So on the one, this creates a bitterness and an arrogance and an abrasiveness that, that cuts you off. This one creates a shame that cuts you off. A shame that wants to hide behind the tree in the garden because you're inferior because what you did was all about self. And now you're afraid for yourself because you see yourself in your own nakedness. So you try to cover yourself by your own stuff, your own fig leaves, and you hide from the very presence of the one who can change everything. Both of these are total self-absorption. Both of them. Have you heard this statement? I'm so sick of all the Christians who are so judgmental. I am so sick of all the Christians who are so judgmental. But you're being judgmental of all the Christians that are so judgmental. I'm gonna say it to you this way. Mind your own business and let people live the way they want. Okay. But like, what if you, what if you, you like mind your own business and let them live the way they want? Oh, here's another one. I cannot stand people who look down on other people. I cannot stand people who look down on other people. Who do they think they are? You think they're better than me? You think you're better than me? And it's superior pride. You're looking down your nose at people that look down their nose. And what happens with this? Pride kills you. But, but don't just stop there. Pride kills you. See, What's crazy is pride is all about like self-preservation and yet it kills you. It's to protect you, but it destroys you. Pride kills you without you even knowing it. Pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. 40,000 people will go to the, the ER this year because of carbon monoxide poisoning, just walking around doing life and all of a sudden they're in the ER because it's a silent killer, can poison you without you even seeing it or smelling it coming. And here's, what's the, here, here, here's the big problem. The more you have it, the less you realize you have it. The more you have pride, the less you realize you have pride. Let me give you another, let me give you another example. Work, work with me here. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? You've been thinking about someone else during this sermon. Man, I wish my son was here to hear this. I hope he's taking notes right now on the dear lease. <laughs> it will kill you from the inside out. Listen, listen. The sin of pride, if you don't even know you're doing it, that's one thing. But like the, like the sin of committing adultery, it's not like that happens incognito. You don't wake up and say, you're not my wife. <laughs> Embezzlement. You don't just wake up and say, how did that $300,000 get in my bank account? No, you know, you see what you're doing and there's a reality to it. And this is why it's so deadly and so dangerous is because very often you never see it coming. So what's the cure? Okay, Pastor Jeremy, give me the cure because obviously we're in church. I'm assuming it's get closer to God. It's pray more. What is it? Okay, and hurry it up. I got a lot of things to do today. 
believe it or not, believe it or not, the cure for pride is not more of God. And this is what happens in Christianity. We think if I can become a better Christian, if I start doing a lot more things, all of a sudden this ruthless, sleepless, relentless concentration on self becomes all the things I do and everywhere I serve and how much I gave, okay? And that superior pride looks down on everyone else like a Pharisee, look at what I do. See how I go to church and they don't go to church? See how I read the Bible at least four times a week and they only read it two times a week? Or the inferior pride of, of following Jesus, I'll never live up to God's standard and I'll never be as good as that person. I never, and both of them are, both of them are pride. And you know what both of them build? Ego. Here's what ego is, E-G-O, edging God out. When your ego gets bigger and bigger, you are edging God out. So the answer is not more of God in your life. Because do you know that when you first get saved, it's not like he gives you a junior varsity salvation. It's not that he gives you 3.7% of his presence. He gives you himself. But the truth is, even when you invite him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, there's still a whole lot of flesh. There's still a whole lot of you. So it's not more of God, it's, it's less of you. It's less of you. It's, it's, not, it's not thinking less of yourself not thinking down on yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. It is filling that gap with less thoughts about me, myself, and I. You know it, you know it. There are people that walk into a room and you do it and I do it too. There are people who walk into the room and they are a here I am person. And that's driven by pride. When you walk into a room and you're a there you are person, it changes things. When's, this Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving, you can be a here I am person. It'd be nice to get the, maybe some recognition for all, the, for all the food I've made. But what would it look like to be a there you are person? I tell you what that looks like. It's a little less of you and it fills space for more opportunity of God and we get to experience the fullness of him instead of the fullness of you. So this is our case study today as we wrap up, what happens is Haman leaves that first banquet and he's happy and in high spirits. He's like, this is great, look at me, nobody else is invited. How you doing, Keith, you doing good, Keith? Hey, what's up, Tom? Yeah, well, where was I? With, with Queen Esther and the king, we just, you know, we're just doing our thing. You weren't invited? Oh, a little some some just for kind of the nobility royal stuff, all good. Wish you were there, <laughs> hashtag next time. <laughs> and as he is leaving high on the hog, when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Isn't it interesting? All the stuff in your life that is good can be sucked out when you deal with pride. All the happiness will be sucked out of your life if you only focus on self. And he is enraged that the very fact, and so Haman goes home, he says to his wife, Zeresh, Zeresh, call, call the friends, game night. What game do you wanna play? Scrabble, I'm awesome at it. I'm gonna kill tonight on Scrabble. Let's uh, fire up the grill, we got, some, we got some pork chops, let's go. Sure enough, he gets everybody together, he's grilling the pork chops, they're saying, oh, Haman, this barbecue sauce, I made it myself, nobody has barbecue sauce like I've got. And he goes on to brag about himself. Here's what scripture says. Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and the officials. And that's not all, Haman added. <laughs> you think that's not all? Of course it's not all when you're so full of pride. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to the company that came to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. Look how cool I am. And his friends are like, Haman, 
Go, Haman, 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 Haman. He's like, stop, stop, no, don't, don't, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. But he does say, all this gives me no satisfaction. Pride will never satisfy you. You'll be happy you're the smartest person in the room until you're not obviously the smartest person in the room and you'll be so dissatisfied. And so you'll keep out of that room to find another room and you'll never grow and you'll never learn. I'm so dissatisfied as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. Careful who you surround yourself with that are just gonna speak to that same pride. Listen to me, just stop it. Stop the Facebook posts that are asking for other people to just encourage you. I, I want you to know, we won't do life alone at Timber Creek. If you need someone to truly encourage you, stop getting it from fake likes and fake posts and you saying, oh, I told they may be the stepmom, but I am the mom and I'm gonna tell it right now. And what you're really hoping is someone will say, you are an awesome mom because deep down inside, you are being challenged. You are, you are struggling and you need someone to tell you, I want you to know this is the kind of church that will help you become who you're called to be. But it can't be based on pride. It's gotta be based on God. It's gotta be his grace operating in our lives. Now his wife, Zeresh, said to him, have a pole set up, Haney, reaching to a height of 50 cubits, like 75 feet tall. Here's what you're gonna do. She is, she's stroking the, the, his, his hair like this. He's laying in bed all mad. You, you, you reach to a height of 50 cubits and here's what you do. Ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it and then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. You deserve a little Haney time. Kill that dude and then go on it and drank. And here's what the Bible says. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. So after he brushed his teeth and got back in bed and laid down and was looking at the stars in the heavens through the, through the, moon, through the, the moonlight, he closes his eyes and say, tomorrow's gonna be a great day. I'm gonna kill that sucker. Meanwhile, take the drone shot and go across to the palace, to the royal bedroom, to the master bed. And that night, that same night, the king couldn't sleep. Restless leg syndrome, pizza from, from Pizza Hut there at Esther's. It just. And so he gets up, he rings the bell, the servant comes in, yes, this is my king, and he goes, hey, read me a story. Says, what kind of story? Cinderella, Jack and the Beanstalk, Transformers. He's like, no, 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 no. He ordered the book of history, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. He's saying, nah, Jack and the Beanstalk, tell me stories about me. That'll make me sleep at night. You know, I wanna hear about me. <laughs> so sure enough, they pull the, the book out and, and they begin to read. Oh, you, the 125th province became 127 provinces when you took over this and this. Oh, that's right. They flip through, tell more stories. Oh, this, this was a few months ago. Uh, 72 degrees outside on that Thursday. Stocks were up 7.2%. Um, let's see, what else, what else, what else? The mayor cut a ribbon on, this, on the Citadel. Oh, 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 oh. Remember this? Um, there was an assassination plot that was thwarted. You were gonna get killed. The Bible says Big Thana and Teresh were, were hung on poles uh, and it was Mordecai that, that uncovered that whole plot. And the king lifts up out of bed and says, I totally forgot about that. He says, what, what have we done for Mordecai? And the attendant says, it, there's no record of doing anything for him. And he goes, oh, you know what? Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm gonna do something for Mordecai. And across the city, Haman is saying tomorrow, 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 I'm gonna put you on a pole tomorrow. <laughs> and so the alarms go off in the palace and in Haman's house, and they both wake up. It's a beautiful morning. And the king is combing his hair and he's got his gold scepter and he's walking to the throne because he wants to take care of the homie that took care of him. And Haman kisses his wife and ties his tie and grabs his briefcase and, you know, 
goes walking into the king's court. And as, as Haman walks into the king's court, the king says, Haman! And the Haman says, King Xerxes! You know, and he's like, man, I, I want to talk to you about something, Haman. And, and Haman says, that's crazy, great minds. I want to talk to you about something. And the king's like, who should go first? And Haman says, ah, his only like unselfish moment, you go first, king. <laughs> you go first. And here's what the king says to him. There's a guy in my kingdom that I mean is top of my list right now. And Haman's like, say more. <laughs> because he thinks it's him. That's what the Bible says. He thinks, he thinks he's talking about Haman. And so I want to honor this guy. And he says this statement, what can the king do for a man the king delights to honor? What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? And now is his chance. So he might as well lay it on thick. And Haman says, well, <laughs> hashtag humbled. But here's what I would do. If you really wanna honor him, what if, now go with me, king, okay? Go with me, Xerx. What if you take your own royal robes and put it on him? And the king's like, okay. Wouldn't even have thought of that. Love it, go. What else? More, okay. What if you get the white horse from the stables, put the crest, and let him ride around in the city on one of your royal steeds. <laughs> okay, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Anything else? Haman's like, more? So, yeah, well, what I would do is I would get a very prominent person in the land, like high up there, to take the reins of that horse. And as we're going through the city, that that person would announce, bah, bah, da, da, and would say, this is the man the king delights to honor. And the king says, I love the way you think this is perfect. That's why you are where you are, Haman. And Haman goes like this, I'm here to serve your majesty. And he holds because he's waiting for the robes to be put on himself. And he's looking around and there's no robes coming, but that's okay, I'm gonna stay right here. And the king says, make it so, make it done, go at once and get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew. And Haman is gonna be the one who takes the reins, and walks through the city with a 75 foot impaling pole in his backyard walking by his own house behind, be, with his own wife behind the picket fence going. <laughs> Talk about not humbled, humiliated, humiliated. As we end today, though, what Haman asked for really wasn't that bad. As a matter of fact, write this down. Haman, when he approached the king, he wasn't asking for the wrong thing. For the royal robes and for the steed and for the, for the announcement and the proclamation, I mean... For someone who thwarted an assassination plot, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, that's pretty strong. They should be honored. And a right king would honor like that. Let me say it this way. Don't get lost in writing it down that you get it lost in understanding it for your own heart. Haman is not asking for the wrong thing because you and me, it means something. When someone who means something says, you mean something. Every single one of us, it means something. When someone who means something says, you mean something. It's why we do appreciate encouragement. 
It's why there are 49-year-old women who are being great moms, but they become an eight-year-old with pigtails when they get back in Thanksgiving, just waiting for the dad who means something to them to say back to them what they wish they could have heard all their life, but they've not heard their own dad who means something to them say, you mean something to me. And, and it's, just, it's, it's just riddled up their life with insecurity. People chasing that promotion, chasing the job, chasing the accolades, chasing the stuff. Why? Because it means something. Why won't, if, if, if I can just get a little bit better grade, maybe the teacher will notice. If I can just get a better, just a better sales contract, maybe the boss will notice. If I can just, and, and it's a relentless concentration on self because it means something when someone who means something says you mean something. See, Haman, he wasn't asking for the wrong thing. My kids need that. My kids need to be looked in the eyes, Graham Jeremiah. You mean something to me, son. And it's not about getting it all right all the time because you and I both know that ain't happening. But you don't do another single thing with your life. I love you. I love your life. I love that you're my son, nobody else's son. God gave you to me. You mean something to me and your mom. That's why we're gonna train you up to not be a fool. Because God will oppose fools, son. You mean something to me. Haman wasn't asking the wrong thing, listen to me. Haman was asking the wrong king. Because the one who means everything You don't even have to try and figure out how you could get the royal robes. The king of all kings already decided that he would let his own son be stripped of all royalty and all royal robes and take on not a steed, but take on a cross and deliver to you and to me through the city and through the galaxies. This is a man the king of all kings desires to honor. And because Jesus was crushed and Jesus was humiliated, you have the chance to be honored. You have the chance to be clothed in the royal robes of righteousness that you could never earn because the one true king sees you and values you and it's not because what you could do superior or inferior it's because who he says you are he just wanted a king to say he meant something your king says listen your king says You mean something so much to me that I would spend my own son to prove it. Let's pray. Simple prayer. Can I invite you to pray it with me? Here's the prayer. God, I'm proud. I have pride. I have pride. So God, will you reveal to me areas that you won't humble me, I have to humble myself. When you humble me, it's humiliation, honestly. But I choose humility today. I choose to become less, not to be thought of and valued less, but I'm going to think of myself less to give you the space to be the king you are in my life. And we ask it in the name of the strong son who became weak, the beautiful son who became the sacrifice. Everybody said amen.